Hello, I'm Dan. And I'm Simon. And this is the Wikicast, a podcast where Wikipedia takes us to a random article and we talk about what we find. Simon, what are we talking about this week? Daniel, this week I am delighted to say that we are talking about Prostanthera densa. Bless you. That's a really awful cold you've got. Good grief. I, te- I tell you what, we were talking just before we started recording. I have had the worst cold that I can remember having in like the past 10 years over the past couple of weeks. It was awful. And I blame Matt Cole. If you're listening to this, you son of a bitch. I'm blaming you. <laughs> because well, well, we'll get to that later. We'll get to all that. Because I want to first talk about Prostanthera densa, uh, commonly known as the Villus mint bush. Now, is that a name that you recognise, Dan? The Villus mint bush no so i will read on in the little one uh, what two sentence summary at the start of the page uh known as the villus mint bush is a species of flowering plant in the family lamiaceae and is endemic to near coastal areas of new south wales i don't know if you will have ever run into this plant in your time in australia i probably have done i mean not knowingly but because new south wales was the bit you were in Right? No, I was in Victoria. Victoria, oh, okay. Yeah. It's a small country. I mean, they're basically next to each other. Well, right? exactly. You know, stones throw away. <laughs> Tell you what, something that I learned yesterday that blew my mind, I'm reading this David Attenborough book at the moment, um, mm. is that Indonesia is as broad, so from west to east, as the continental United States of America. Gosh. that I, I, I don't know why, but those two things were very different sizes in my head. Um, yeah. Sorry, just a little. That's the, that's your one bit of education for this episode, folks. Um, but um, yeah, so back to this 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 uh, mint bush. Um, I love the description here uh, because <laughs> it's it's so unique. Um, the bush is an erect, often compact shrub with aromatic branches, egg shaped leaves, and mauve flowers with orange markings inside. Wow, that sounds quite attractive. Erect, often compact, and aromatic is precisely how Pixel Girl actually describes me. Um, Perfect. It's lovely when these things come together, isn't it? Uh, it it's, a, it's a very nice picture, actually, uh, on, on the article. It's, so this flower kind of looks like a... Um, the closest thing I can think of is a flamenco dancer. There's like a uh, the two arms kind of fanning out two petals, and then there's a kind of skirt that is being distributed by uh, centrifugal force. Uh, and mm. then in the middle of that, there's these little orange bits. It's, it's altogether quite nice to look at, actually. Pretty. Um, but it's uh, it's vulnerable, Dan. Oh, no. Aren't we all in this day and age? Good grief. Bad news. It's, it's listed as vulnerable under the Australian Government Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, 1999, mm. and the New South Wales Government Biodiversity Conservation Act of 2016. The main threats to the species include land clearing for urban development, dieback caused by some species I can't pronounce, uh, dumping of garden refuse, weed invasion, and disturbance by recreational users. Uh, Are people smoking this bush, Dan? No idea. I'm slightly worried now. (laughs) That that is my question to you. Oh, it's bloody cold. Sorry. Can you hear it in my voice? I can, yeah. It doesn't actually sound as bad as I've heard it before, but I can definitely hear that you're a bit... Um, yeah, because I recorded a video that. a few days ago, and I just sounded so, I sounded like Peter Jackson. I was just so bunged up. Um, I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired, Dan. That's it. It's not actually that bad. I'm just tired of being this way. Hmm. Um, but um, yeah, so basically, th- there isn't a huge amount else on this article, but I thought it was quite interesting just because it was was well, it's it's erect hmm. uh, and it's a bush and it's from uh, Australia. And there's some sort of conservation stuff to do with it, and it is quite pretty. So, well, I mean, yeah. it's sort of in the. It's sort of we're, we're going to get slightly political here, Simon, but it's in absolutely the wrong state if you're wanting to look at um, biodiversity and ecology and generally giving a toss about the environment. Because of course, as we throw oh, yeah. back episodes and episodes ago to the conversation we had when I was talking about this very interesting court case that's going through Australia in the moment. Indeed, it is New South Wales. Um, their, their premier and deputy premier, premier um, Gladys Berejiklian, I think, and um, what's his name, the the, the silly man. Um, <laughs> that could be. That doesn't narrow it down much. Whose name escapes me? Um, like oh Abbott. God, that's Is really embarrassing. Steve Abbott. No. Um, yeah. What's that Australian? What's the Australian Abbott's first name? Barilaro. That's his name. Tony Abbott. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, Tony. Tony Abbott. Oh, right, Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> what's a good word? Yeah, they're, they're uh, that that's sort of their um, remit. So and they're terrible. They've they've done some really really dreadful dreadful things for 
uh, the environment, including killing off a load of koalas. And um, and dredging um, the Great Barrier Reef, am I correct mm. in saying? Mm. This, there was a whole thing about, you know, I know there's this unique, amazing miracle of nature, but what if there wasn't any more? Mm. Uh, it was basically the debate, as far as I could tell. What was it, the Prostanthera? Prostanthera densa. Densa. Or the villus mint bush. What does villus even mean? Co- oh, great. It's covered in villi. Or in botany, it's... <laughs> I love that. On Wikipedia, it has like the different definitions of... In anatomy, it means it's covered in villi. In mm. botany, it means shaggy. Ah, brilliant. So there we go. It's the, it's the, <laughs> the shaggy erect compact bush. Mm. Wow. God, I love this thing. Um... Well, well actually, so going back to the coral thing, again, sorry, I, I promise I'll stop educating people in this podcast, but another thing that I learned the other day that was actually quite interesting was uh, why corals and coral species are so um, vulnerable to changes in climate. Um, mm. Because obviously, you know, we've seen coral bleaching uh, as the oceans become more acidic and, and warmer, corals start to die off. One of the reasons why they're so much more vulnerable to this than a lot of other species is that they are um, symbionts. So there are multiple species that rely on each other um, mm. in order for the coral to survive. And um, furthermore, they are basically tropical species, uh, which means that they are actually evolved to, to deal with, each species has evolved to deal with a relatively small thermal range, like a thermal tolerance. Mm. Um, and so all it takes is for one of those species to start suffering, and then the whole shebang starts falling apart, yeah. which isn't quite the same in a lot of other, especially mid-latitude ecosystems. Um, yeah, but something that I learned that I thought might depress. It's like uh, it's like pulling the thread of a polymix jumper. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm sure is. that's yeah. how David Attenborough probably describes it. <laughs> probably, probably. It's like pulling a thread on your favorite jumper, and the whole f-ing thing falls apart. <laughs> exactly. I'd lo- I'd love a series of honest David Attenborough, where he just like it, it's like the, the, the they release it posthumously, and he just goes ham. Mm. On, 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 you know, everybody. You f***ing idiots. I warned you. I've been saying this for 60 years. Literally 60 years. And you haven't bloody listened. Not one of you. I had to put up with Prince Charles for 30 f***ing years. <laughs> I'd love that. Imagine if you had Listen. David Attenborough as your force ghost following you around. As your force ghost, did you say? Yeah, to steal a bit from the Triforce podcast, what yes. you had... To, uh, uh, assisting you. I would in prefer. Your daily life. I would prefer Charles. I think in, as Pyrian Flax so so aptly uh, described. Ooh, uh, Camilla, um, try one of my <laughs> Dutchy creams. Try, try one of my Dutchy creams. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Have you considered going to the National Trust gift shop? <laughs> I'm a member. I'm a, I'm a member of the National Front. I mean the National Trust. Trust. I just, I just want David Attenborough there narrating me, putting my recycling away, or you know, <laughs> or coming in and just changing. So, if you were to live in a smart home, mm. to have somebody just say, as you say, like um, Prince Charles or David Attenborough, just to let you know that your toast is done. <laughs> Really, really kind of banal, inane, inane things. But they sound annoyed. They're like, this is beneath me. Yes, yeah. David just comes out of the kitchen and is just like, ah, your toast is ready. <laughs> like, he still does it, but he's not happy about it. That was, that was less David Attenborough and more, I release you. From uh, <laughs> was it Two Towers? Uh, no, it's um. Yes, it is. It's Gandalf in the Two mm. Towers. Yeah, yeah. What a time! You have no power here, David Attenborough. <laughs> I am David the White. I'm looking at my uh, I'm looking at my timer at the moment, and it reads 11 minutes 44 seconds since I started uh, recording, which will obviously not be the same as how long this uh, podcast has been running, but it's only taken that long for our, for our conversation to completely devolve into meaningless twaddle. Right. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're where we're supposed to be, Dan. We are in our niche, or niche if you're American. We are exactly where we're supposed to be. But you know what? Where were we supposed to be two weekends ago, Dan? Where were we supposed to be? And in fact, where we were. What I'm saying ah, is we followed all Right, because got. I was very confused then. Well, we were supposed to be, and as you so rightly say, we were uh, both in the choir, Q-U-I-R-E, of Exeter Cathedral. It was very exciting. Singing some musical notes. 
Yeah, we had our, a reunion weekend. We got to see each other in the flesh for the first time in... Actually, I'm not sure how long, but like a year, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we, we got to sing three services, I think, and uh, imbibe a certain amount of, of beverages. Uh, yes. Some more well, than now, others. See, yeah, some more than others. I had just, I had just literally that... So I saw you on the Saturday rehearsal and, and choir had been singing on the Friday. Is that right? Uh, yes, we did an even song, which was uh, bu- 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 Gibbons. Gibbons Second Service oh, yes. and uh, another bit of Gibbons, which I can't remember. I was travelling back from Oxford that Saturday, having been in um, recording this Christmas CD mm. at Keeble College for the week. So I was. it was a fairly extraordinary Friday night. Um, because we'd been very good, well, most of us had been very good all week and not had late nights, not been drinking, um, because obviously, you know, we need to be on form for this CD. But the Friday night rap party was was pretty, pretty extraordinary. Mm. Um, so I came, I was getting the train back from Oxford feeling fairly hungover. Well, well, I say feeling, I could feel it in my voice. I, in myself, actually felt fine. Um, mm. And then... Literally arrived home, dumped my bags. I had fifteen minutes to quickly shower and change, um, and then uh, and then do more singing, which was mad. And I think we did we did the rehearsal. Went to the pub. I managed about twenty five thirty minutes. Came home. It would have been about quarter to five in the evening, and slept until half past nine. Shoveled some toast in my face briefly as I woke up and then went straight back to, to sleep, ready to get up for Sunday morning Eucharist, which was, uh, it was a pretty full, it's been a full on August. God, I'm knackered. Sometimes singing is an endurance event, you know? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, it really was uh, on that trip, uh, especially for, it's, I've got to put a special shout out to Hugo Whitman, uh, our friend who uh, was doing a, a banging solo and did it extremely well, I've got to say, in uh, Parry's Hear My Words EP. Yeah, yes, it was glorious. Um, despite the fact that he was absolutely wankered mm. uh, <laughs> for about two nights in a row. Um, so, uh, you know, and he still stood up and absolutely smashed it. Uh, and, you know, fair play to him. But that is that is one of these these cases where, you know, it's, it's one of the soft skills, I think, of singing. Obviously, there's the hard skills of getting the notes right and, and putting... Um, uh, you know, meaning into into what you're singing and supporting your breath, but there's soft skills like singing on a hangover that really are just as important. Some would say, yeah, um, and also you know not falling asleep in services, which I think one or two people might have actually done over the weekend. Yes, it was a strong effort all round. I think it was it was great though. It was lovely to see you. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say it was absolutely it was so nice just to actually you know see and see so many actually so many alumni yeah. that came down. It was really really lovely. I think made all the better not only because. Obviously, so many of us won't have seen each other as regularly because of being alumni and, and people leaving Exeter. Um, but then with with COVID and lockdown and things, I think the the sort of urge and the hunger to see people was that much more intense. And we got to do some of the classic things that... Well, it was quite funny. I, I put a picture of us two up on my Instagram and people were like, this is the non-tent we want. And they were like, can you do another PhD just so you can do more of stuff like this? Yes. Um, but, you know, we hit all the classic benchmarks. We were singing in the cathedral together. We didn't sing in the chapel, admittedly. Uh, no, that's we true. Did, we, we got a, a roast at Firehouse. Um, mm. we, we, you know, hung out with our friend, you know, Many classic characters from the PhD vlog, like Michael and uh, Pixel Girl and Hugo, and oh, it's just great yeah. uh, all round. Uh, I think the highlight though is possibly um, so. Well, there were two highlights, if I may. We are staying. Uh, those of us who don't live in Exeter, obviously Dan does, uh, in the Cathedral School. So there is next to Exeter Cathedral. There's a very estab- very old and very established um, Cathedral School for uh, goes from reception up to about year eight or nine. I think. Year eight. Like, yeah. Um, uh, and um, there are boarders there, but obviously not at the moment because it was the summer. Um, so we got to stay in their accommodation. And um, <laughs> basically we were given bunk beds and the, whatever linen they had available, which is obviously meant for children. Um, needless to say, uh, there was a bit of a kerfuffle uh, and I emerged victorious with my favourite set of bed linen that I slept in in ages, which was the Batman bed linen. Oh, super. Uh, I 
I got to sleep surrounded by Gotham's night, uh, which was great. Um, but the other highlight was in that school, we rehearsed on the Saturday in the school gym. Uh, and how would you describe the acoustics of that gym, Dan? I think even trying to describe that gym using the word acoustic may be generous. Yes, it was. So it was wooden, uh, wooden floor. It was a gym, wooden uh, ceiling, bare brick walls, and about twelve tenors. Yeah. Of whom about half sing now professionally. Mm. Um, <laughs> and the, the the thing that I can, if people, especially if you don't do sing yourself, there's that scene in Pacific Rim when a tear in reality. You know, erupts underneath the Pacific Ocean, mm. and kaiju start pouring out. I would guess that we were about half a decibel off of that happening in Exeter Cathedral School. Yeah, it was quite possibly the loudest thing I've ever heard. Um, we're just singing uh, Dyson and wait, was it Dyson and D or Brewer and D? Dyson and D. Yeah, Dyson and D. Uh, <laughs> it was quite extraordinary. I get to reprise that, actually. I'm I'm depping um, Thursday, Friday and Saturday at the cathedral next week. And I think Thursday. Thursday, we have Dyson, uh, Dyson and D. And Friday, we have uh, Stamford, uh, Stamford, uh, Stopford um, Truro service. But I'm oh, particularly lovely. looking forward to um, the noise <laughs> that we'll be able to generate with the, through, the, through the Dyson. I mean, the the thing is, you it's difficult to get satisfyingly loud in the cathedral, though. Compared certainly compared to that acoustic, because it mm. is, it, you have to work so much harder to get the, the yeah, noise. Yeah, it's out. pretty cavernous, especially singing in the choir. It's much easier in the nave. Yes, for sure. So I don't I don't know if you notice the difference at Eucharist as opposed to even song. Oh, absolutely. And and when we sang there before, you know, I just I always used to dread, to be honest, when we actually had to sing in the. So for those of you who don't know what the choir is, that's basically the bit surrounded by wood that um. Uh, in cathedrals, there's like a screen that divides normally where the pews are or the seating, and then there's the bit where the choir normally sits. Um, mm. And in Exeter Cathedral, that is surrounded by dark wood, and um, that is the Q-U-I-R-E, and it's a, just a dead acoustic. Whereas out in the front, in the nave, um, and actually even better, is in the Lady Chapel right at the back. Mm. Um, that's a wonderful acoustic. But yeah, it, it, out front, it's so much so much better which is of course where we performed one of my favorite pieces one of our favorite pieces i think the vienne mess um mm. oh god that was loud as well it was great become a singer everybody you just get to make noise it's wonderful it is glorious right is there anything else you would like to learn dan about this bush um or shall we move on i think you've been pretty comprehensive well we've also been pretty comprehensive on talking about singing but we have yet to talk about your so I went all William Shatner. We have yet to talk about your choral piece of the week. And this will be my piece of the week. Drum roll, please. So, as is tradition, I'm going to break the rules. Um, choral piece what of the week. What is the point of having the rules, Dan? I know choral. Um, well. Actually, okay, fine. I won't break the rule because there was two things I wanted to talk about and I can talk about one of them in Critics Corner. So that's absolutely fine. Oh, okay. Um, my choral piece of the week is, much like last time, going to be a Christmas piece, but it's different because uh, I'm not singing a solo on it and just basically kind of tooting my own trumpet. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have I've spent the last um, last week in my free time on an evening, planning Christmas repertoire for the Chagford Singers. Um, ah. The first social evening um, and sort of meet and greet, because most of the choir won't really have properly met me unless they came to my my audition rehearsal, um, is on the 8th of September, so next week. In fact, the evening after my first exam. Um, so I've had to be putting together a repertoire list and gathering music and thinking about what I'm doing. And as a result, uh, I've really fallen back in love with a particular piece. Um, there's going to be all the sort of classic carols. There's going to be a, f a few chorus movements from the Messiah, various other things. Um, however, I will also be doing, which I believe is going to be new to the choir, the Shepherd's Carol by Bob Chilcott. Oh, yes. Yeah. And it's really, really lovely. I mean this in the old fashioned sense of the word. It is very gay. 
it's very twee and it's very happy, isn't it? I'm thinking the right one, isn't it? You might be. You might actually be thinking of the Shepherd's Pipe Carol. Oh, there's two. Oh, sorry, that is what I was thinking of. Yeah. Oh, right. So the Shepherd's Carol is far more sort of atmospheric. Oh. Uh, in fact, actually, I'll read you the lyrics. It's very short. It's very nice, and it reads. We stood on the hills, lady, our day's work done, watching the frosted meadows that winter had won. The evening was calm, lady, the air so still. Silence more lovely than music folded the hill. There was a star, lady, shone in the night, larger than Venus it was, and bright, so bright. Oh, a voice from the sky, lady, it seemed to us then, telling of God being born in the world of men. And so we have come, lady, our day's work done, our love, our hopes, ourselves, we give to your son. And it's really, it's just lovely. It's really, really lovely. Um, and I'm going to be doing that with uh, Chagford. Um, and I'm really, really looking forward to it. So that's The Shepherd's Carol by Bob Chilcott. And there is a fantastic recording of it. It comes, at no, it comes as no surprise on the Christmas with St. John's album from St. John's College, Cambridge. And it is track one on that album and it's uh it's really really glorious oh wow sorry oh well I, I was not aware that there was more than one shepherd based carol yeah uh, in the title at least you are sorry. right though the sort of the sort of gay frivolity of shepherd's pipe carol is absolutely yeah absolutely true exactly sorry that was exactly how it goes guys mm. focus keep that in all right, all right, all right, all right. Well, Dan, we find ourselves in Critics' Corner. Mm. Uh, and, um, well, we, something which we didn't mention uh, before is that before we were in Exeter together, uh, unfortunately, you actually couldn't come. I think originally the plan was that you were going to join us, weren't you? Um, uh, in Yorkshire. In Yorkshire. We did a, a quick little trip up um, with uh, myself and Hugo and uh, Pixel Girl and also the one and only Dan Hanvey mm. came with us, uh, which was great value. Um and um, my review of that trip was that it was fantastic. Um, but I would like to critique from that. There are actually two things from that trip, and I will limit myself just to that this episode because I don't want to don't want to keep everybody here forever. Um, is have you seen Garth Marenghi's Dark Place? I have not. Right. Ah, oh, it is fantastic. Um, right. So basically, it's it's kind of unlike anything I've ever seen before. Um, we watched it over the course of two evenings because there's only six episodes um, in Yorkshire. And basically, Garth Marenghi is a fictional character. He is a uh, a crap version of Stephen King uh, who wrote terrible, terrible horror stories. And the Garth Marenghi's Dark Place is a Channel 4 show from about oh, the late 2000s, I want to say, um, about Garth Marenghi's reflections on a TV show that he made in the 80s. Right. Um, uh, which was called Dark Place, um, which he thought was groundbreaking. It was ahead of its time and it was cancelled because nobody was ready for it yet. Um, and the show, which is the most part of the show, it's like a show within the show, uh, is awful. It's 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 so bad, but in an incredibly funny way. Mm. So it's bad from a production perspective um, because like the camera angles are all off. People are framed with like two thirds of the frame being headroom um one character's dialogue is all completely adr um there's continuity errors there's editing errors there's all kinds of stuff like that mm. um and then in between the show uh, clip, you know sort of sections there's interviews with the people like garth Marenghi, but also dean lerner his publisher who plays a character and matt berry who's playing uh, todd rivers who's like an who was the established actor in the series right. um reflecting on the show and how it was so good and kind of ego boosting garth Marenghi. um it's gloriously weird it's so so strange um yeah and it's like you know to give uh, one of the episodes is about um one of the doctors becoming telekinetic and starting to control all objects around the hospital that then start attacking everybody um and you know they have to they go down in the basement and get attacked by like a cordless iron and a filing cabinet and stuff like that or there's another episode where he <laughs> Garth Marenghi's character has a baby no, no, he adopts a baby, um, which is basically just like a, uh, a beholder from Dungeons and Dragons. Like, it's just an eyeball um, <laughs> to replace his own son, who was half son, half grasshopper. It's so weird, Dan. 
You'd love it. You'd absolutely love it. It does sound it. sort of like quite up my street. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's it's Richard Iowardi uh, and Matt Berry and oh, I can't remember the guy, the name of the guy who plays Goth Marenghi. I do love, I do love Richard Iowardi. He's great because his character in the show is the hospital director but the he's playing the actor who plays him obviously and that actor cannot act at all um it's just it's so bad it's i i i've been it's it's one of these things it's a cult following and once you watch it you'll become obsessed with it and you'll quote it all the time it's a bit it's a little like community or something like that you know but like once mm. you're in you'll keep quoting it to everybody else who also knows it um but a hard recommend if people haven't seen this i'll include a link in the show notes to uh and you know sort of a highlights reel and um i think you'd really like it but dan i've been talking for like four minutes what would you like to critique well i've actually got several things so i'm going to try and rattle through them because i don't want to ramble on and on i mentioned mm. earlier that i wanted to review something i was listening to and i didn't want to break the choral piece of the week because it's not choral at all but it is an album Right. And that album is The Age of Plastic um, by The Buggles. Oh, oh no, I'm thinking of Plastic Beach. Um, oh, okay. Which features the choice. classic tune Video Killed the Radio Star. Killed the Star. Radio Star. Yeah. And, and Kid Dynamo. And I Love You, Miss Robot. And it's just great. Anyway, it's recently, to the best of my knowledge, been put on to Apple Music with um, Dolby Atmos lossless audio. Oh, right, yeah. So if you've got a good set, a good speaker, a good set of headphones, it's a really, really high quality audio stream. Um, and whenever I was doing any traveling over August, I just found that I was putting this album on repeat because it is so good. Um, oh, wow. Okay. So I want, so I, I, uh, Johnny on the monorail. Um, I, I got, it's, 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 it's just, yeah, it's fantastic. So I highly recommend, obviously we all know that video killed the radio star is an absolutely brilliant, brilliant song. Um, but the, the whole, um, the age of plastic album, I would highly Highly recommend. It's very, very fine indeed. Um, I have started the the lengthy journey uh, that is trying to get into Star Wars: The Clone Wars. Oh, okay. Um, the animated TV series. When you say the animated, do you mean the two D animated or the three D animated? I mean the three D animated. Right. I think that's what I mean. Well, because there was the there was the incredibly stylized by oh god is it Android Tarkovsky or something like that there was like a a two D cartoon that is also meant to be great um but sort of very very different Star Wars the Clone Wars I'm yeah I'm these are definitely three D animations mm. um, directed by Dave Filoni who of course went on to do the Mandalorian of course which is why he brought back uh is it Ashoka. Uh, oh I yes, I've, I've heard, right. yes, I've heard about this. Um, so yeah, he, he's like the new kingpin. <laughs> I'm on episode season one, episode four, and there are seven seasons, and each season has umpteen number of episodes. But I'm trying to get into it because Michael Graham has reminded me many, many times of how good it is, and that I need to he's watch it. He's such a Star Wars fan, isn't he? He is. He's a Star Wars nut. I also, um, Michael, be pleased with this. I finally, got round to watching Spider-Man: Homecoming. <laughs> Oh, what did you think? Which I enjoyed. Yeah. That's good. But I mean, all the Spider-Man films are great. Have you seen uh, Into the Spider-Verse? I have. Oh, very, I rewatched that for like the third or fourth time because we watched it. That was the other thing that happened to me recently was I was a, a scout leader for a week. I was um, I was helping out on camp. And one, one night we did a really magical um, film evening. We put up like a bed sheet in the forest, got mm. a projector out, um, and um, we, we did a screening of, completely legally, uh, Into the Spider-Verse, um, which is just great. Partly because the aesthetics were so different from like camping in an English field. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, but also, it's just such a good film. It might, it's probably my favourite Spider-Man film. It's very good. And I saw, I've, I've recently seen the trailer that features the return of Hello, Peter. Dr. Octopus. Hello, oh. Peter. Yeah, which is very, very exciting. Yeah, very, very hyped um, for that. So, yes, watch those. And now this one I will wax lyrical about a bit more because I only watched it last night. And the only reason I watched it is because I read a, a, a review in The Guardian yesterday morning um, about it. And it's a documentary that's currently on BBC iPlayer called 9 11 Inside the President's War Room. Oh, okay. 20 years ago at 9.03 on the 11th of September 2001, the second of four hijacked planes hit the South Tower of the World Trade Center in New York. America was under attack. President George W. Bush was sitting in front of seven year olds in a classroom in Florida. Members of the president's security detail throughout the next plane uh, could be aimed at them. 
Uh, and basically, this document says here, this, this description, this documentary tells the definitive story of the Bush administration through 12 hours of that momentous day with first-hand testimony, testimony from President Bush, Vice President Dick Cheney, National Security Advisor, uh, advisors and other senior staff who had their hands on the uh, the levers or the levers of power. Um, the events of that day led to two decades of conflict, conflict in Afghanistan and Iraq. As America and its allies now withdraw from Afghanistan and the Taliban resume control, this is the story of how it all began. And it is quite honestly the most spectacular documentary I've seen in a long time. Um, it's, in, it's just nail-bitingly tense. It's a mixture of photos and and clips from that time on that day um mm. with with sort of talking head pieces from um the president and the vice president and various members of the security detail um and there's a sort of ticking timer as as a sort of kind of um prelude to certain shots you know see it's now you know what the, these are all the things that happened between nine what was it um n- i don't know 923 and 933 say and you just it's brilliant i cannot i cannot recommend it highly enough it's it's you know deeply moving and and harrowing obviously as you'd expect it to be mm. um but wow what a documentary and and it's on iplayer you say it's on iplayer yeah 911 inside the president's war room um 89 minutes long and it's available for 11 months oh wow but it's just superb i will i i will check that out do you, do you reckon that's the most intensely studied and documented like kind of hour in human history that sort of hour following the the the, the first plane hitting the, the two towers, probably. I mean, it's I probably. It's, I mean, it's probably comparable to any sort of other immediately pre-wartime event, you know, because there's something that Bush says where it says the first plane strike was an accident, the second plane strike was an attack, mm. the third plane strike was an act of war. Um, yeah, and you have him, you know as he is now talking about you know this he's hit it's a i think it's a british like produced documentary and you can every every now and then you hear a producer or something asking him some questions and he says like you know do you um do you stand by your actions you know do you stand by what you did and and that start of you know announcing war um and and things and it's just a mate when you when you really it's a really interesting insight into the psyche of Bush as president, you know, and it's it's remarkable, really. It really is. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to check that out. Actually, mm. um, I was talking to somebody about nine eleven the other day. Actually, I think it was in the well, obviously, like I think it's on everybody's minds with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, and that's ultimately how we ended up in in this horrible situation right now. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's that's a very good recommendation, Dan. I'll have to check that out. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, actually, I missed you with the recommendation. In Exeter, I gave you my copy of um, uh, Anthropocene Reviewed. And unfortunately, mm. you couldn't. Uh, yeah. uh, we, we had to. We, we, you couldn't hold on to it at the time. I'm going to have to get that to you at some other point because I know you're going to like that as well. I feel like, you know, it's a trade. You give me one recommendation, I'll give you another mm. uh, type thing. Um, but on the subject of recommendations, something that um, our friend Hugo sat down with myself and Pixel Girl because he stayed over here the other night. Um, and we watched a film, which I think you would also really like, um, called Adaptation. Right. Which is written by Charlie Kaufman. Um, and it's weird and it's very wanky, but I think you would like it. Um, so basically it's semi-autobiographical um, uh, by Charlie Kaufman, who you may know from... Um, uh, being John Malkovich, he also did Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind. Generally, a very kind of uh, arty farty wanky writer for films, basically. Um, and um, he was in in the film is hired to adapt a book called The Orchid Thief, which is a real book. Um, and um, the film is basically about his struggles to adapt the book, um, and. It gets a. I can't say too much more than that, I suppose, without spoiling it, really. But um, it's it veers from being autobiographical at a key moment, um, and it's just generally really weird. And best of all, he, uh, you know, uh, Charlie Kaufman is played by Nicolas Cage. Um, right. But because Nicolas Cage has short hair, it's good Nicolas Cage. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard about this. That there's this um. 
uh, like the the correlation between how long Nicolas Cage's hair is and how good the film is. Like if it's short hair, it's generally a good film, and in this mm. case, it's sh- it's short. Um, but it's it's him. Meryl Streep is the author of the book that was being adapted, um, and there's other people like Brian Cox is in it as um. Oh God, what's the name of the the guy? The guy who write he. Uh, Robert McKee, who you may know, he wrote a book about filmmaking, um, and he oh, right. and he he's in the film as that. It, it's ah oh, one of the weirder films I've seen recently. Again, something I think you'd really enjoy. And if people like films about filmmaking and can look past how wanky the whole thing is, mm. uh, I, I think people would really like it. Uh, it was a, it was a recommendation by Hugo. He hadn't watched it before, but um, he he was bang on the money. I'd highly recommend it. Hmm. Gosh, it's uh, we're pushing through stuff this episode. Uh, it's a hive of recommendations. Yeah, good grief. Well, this is what happens when we hadn't recorded in about three weeks. Mm. I can't actually remember. We we we've I've been away for a while. You've been obviously recording uh, as well. Um, so you know, stuff had built up. I guess. <laughs> um, but I've still got more stuff, but we, you know, I've got more material. I I I, I could stay in the audition for longer. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think we we might have to leave it there for now. God, this bloody cold can bugger off. Um, is there anything else that you would like to actually mention before we move on, Dan? I don't believe so. Other than as a brief aside, I've, I'm getting back into reading Ernest Hemingway. Oh, boy. And I'm currently working my way through, through For Whom the Bell Tolls, which, like with most Hemingway, is a bit of a challenge because his prose can be tiring. But um, mm. it's very good. I'm really enjoying it. It's just it's going to take some time. Yes. Um as soon as I hear you're reading a uh, a depressing poet, Dan, I immediately start to worry. <laughs> like, it's just like, oh boy, here he goes again. I just remember reading. So the the um, it's considered. I think. Uh, let me find the. I think it's for whom the bell tolls. Here we go. Novel by Ernest Hemingway. Um, tells the story of Robert Jordan, a young American volunteer attached to a Republican guerrilla unit during the Spanish Civil War. As a, di- uh, as a dynamiter, he is assigned to blow up a bridge during attack on the city of Segovia. And he meets um, he meets a woman and, yeah, things happen. But it's, it's, it's regarded as one of his best works. Okay. And it's, uh, it's very good. It's, he's just got a fascinating style of prose. I really enjoy it. Have you ever read, read any James Joyce? Uh, yeah, I, I did in my first year. I can't for the life... What was it? Ulysses? Yeah. I certainly... I, extracts of it. I don't think I read the entire thing. I don't know how many people have the patience to read the whole thing. Because when you say interesting style, that's what immediately mm. comes to mind, is James yeah. Joyce and his f***ing impenetrable writing style, where you have to read each sentence three times. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you were about to come out and be like, oh, it's the best thing ever, or something. <laughs> I have read the entirety of Paradise Lost. I have too, which I really liked. I actually really, really enjoyed. By Milton, which is fantastic. Yeah. But I couldn't read much at a time. It was like dark chocolate for the brain. I had to only yes. read like a couple of pages and then digest. Yeah, if you try and read any more at one, in one sitting, you'll suddenly realise that you haven't really taken in the last page or two. And then you've got to go back and you're just sort of wasting time. Also, it's something you don't want to rush it. You know, it's like a fine no. wine. You want to sip and enjoy it and, and sort of let it let it sort of wash over your brain. But you also, um, I mean, I personally, when I was reading it, I read it out loud. Oh, yeah. Because I think I think it benefits from that. And I think I'm right in saying that Milton, um, n- n- uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Dictated it. Mm. Um, yeah, because he was think, blind. Yeah, he was blind. But certainly by the time, I don't think he was born blind. I think he became blind over the course of his, his life. Um, and it was, I remember the, the, the book I had. Uh, had like sort of you know a bit of historical context at the front and it was when you actually think about milton who's you know he's blind he's having to dictate this he's bitterly disappointed because the um the the commonwealth the uh, post english civil war commonwealth failed Mm. um you know writing from the perspective of satan you know going into the kingdom of heaven it's, it's i don't know it's just a really there's a lot going on there i'm sure psychologists well i'm sure they have psychologists have had a field day looking through paradise lost i uh in my first year, I wrote a sonnet about of course. Uh, just stop there. about <laughs> about re- about reading Milton. Right. Um, this is amongst the most Dan Moore things to ever Dan Moore. Go on. Right here we go. I found it. I I, I described it as a moronic sonnet. 
M A W O N I C. Oh, uh, and it's called God. The Sonnet is Boo! Lost in Lost in Paradise. Are you ready? Oh, I don't think I am, but I think you're going to read it anyway. It's not meant to be serious. It's meant to be just a bit of a joke. While sitting crossed-legged upon my chair, an urge as though from God does fill the air, and soaring to mine person fills me up, filling me with warmth as like a cup. Reaching to yonder shelf, I pull a book within whose yellowing depths I urge to look, and sitting in my chair I read, er, come with wild and frenzied greed. What bard is this appearing with such grace, his words being chosen from some holy place? Tis Milton, blind but seeing far, into the souls of all who are desiring of a more fulfilling fare. It is this very worth I wish to share. Ah, nice. What a fun, what a time. I was such a knob in my first year. <laughs> well, I'm still a bit of a knob now, but God. <laughs> then we got him, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. <laughs> we got him. <laughs> right, Golly. let's crack on. We need to thank some people, Dan. We do, we do. Top lot. And it's that classic time again where we find ourselves in Patreon Corner, which is our opportunity to say an enormous thank you to those who support us on uh, on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash the Wikicast. We remembered! Um, without... We remembered <laughs> to remembered. say the URL! <laughs> um, uh, without your guys' amazing uh, support, this podcast wouldn't exist. Not only would we not be able to pay for hosting and all the actual really essential things to just make the podcast appear on your device of choice, but we wouldn't be able to pay for our glorious current editor and editor... Um, <laughs> our past editor what would we hang on what do you call Edison. our editor em, editor emeritus I think is what we'll do <laughs> um, uh, so yeah it's. I mean you, you you know you guys keep us going um, you really make Fergus feel so secure in, in this role you know <laughs> like what do you mean we, we can pay our current editor <laughs> well he is like, our current editor how else would you describe it just say our editor like it doesn't need to the, the current just makes it sound so tenuous but given that we've had a list of edit, editors I want to I want to make the point clear that without this amazing <laughs> net, network of patrons we wouldn't have such a high quality uh, podcast that's spanning the years now and is giving vital work um, to, to such talented editors in the plural this is the worst editor of my life. The worst editor of your life so far. <laughs> yes, sure. Sorry, as you were. <laughs> it falls upon me to thank uh, the top dogs, the clear supreme pet of choice uh, in the readership. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to say an enormous thank you to Michael Gustafsson, uh, Martin Narciso, uh, Sam Harvey, Elspeth, Ben Caples, Josh Shiaga. Uh, Henry the Seventh, King of England and of France, Lord of Ireland, Aaron Carey Augustin, Adrian uh, Chan, Naf Laroche, Hasse Hansen, Aaron Jorgensen, Lexi at Front Desk, Eve Sharples, Alistair Fortune, Peter Reed, Maggie, Colin J. Brown, Codzo, Ben McMurtry, Jay Wright, and Eric Bolliger. Thank you so much. How many top dogs do we have now, Dan? That sounded like a lot. Twenty-two. Ooh, Chinese fireball. <laughs> That's uh, we haven't had that one for a while. Uh, we have twenty-four top cats. This is getting a little tighter than I wanted it to be, Dan. Well, well, slow and steady wins the race. I would like to thank those twenty-four top cats, and they are Miko Sipola. I am so sorry that I, I probably mangled that name. There's two umlauts. Who has that in a name? <laughs> Jerry Moore, Nathan Na- Nathan Flatherty. <laughs> Ultra Piggy, one, two, three. Violet Hatch, Abu El Ella, the Physics Boy, Jack Easton, Izzy CC, Nathy Iftikar, Christopher Betterton, Dame Valerie the Third, Layla Medina, Oliver Craigie, Will Jenis Humphreys, Rents Kirk, Oliver Burkhart, Omar Miranda, Colm Mansfield, Princess Andromeda, Choco Cat, Ben Dent, Isabel Ostrowski, Matt McGuire, and Dan Hanvey. Thank you very much, guys, for your support. As Dan says, you make the show possible. So in other words, this is all your fault. Anyway, on to correspondence. Top lad. So we kick off our first correspondence with something that, um, well, I think the subject title alone has sort of slapped me across the face slightly. Um, (laughs) It's, and Fergus, if you could put the... The loudest and and most impressive bleep here because it's it's what it's one of those swear words that really does slap. Um, <laughs> the subject the subject is titled Dan Moore. You. I want people to know that you know you couldn't hear it, but he really he really articulated that. 
There was a lot of venom and vitriol and poison in uh, that expletive. It, really um, was. it begins with a C. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to your imagination as to what that word could be. It's cat. No, I'm kidding. Um, here we are. <laughs> uh, this is from Brummy Mike, and Brummy Mike says, Hiya, boys. Good writings. Yes, good writings. <laughs> Um, just caught up with the last few episodes after taking a couple week internet detox on holiday with family at a certain Buckfast Abbey. Oh! Only now do I hear that everyone's top favorite, top five favorite Wikicast presenters was one of the voices I was hearing at Sunday Mass. If only I'd known. Hey! Uh, anyway, what I'm actually writing for is some advice. I'm a low key, high key. I'm low key, high key, scared of reading. As a kid, I read loads, but I found as I went through my teenage years that it was becoming harder and harder. In year nine, I stopped reading altogether and haven't read a single book since, including my uh, English lit GCSE books. Still got um, an eight A star, not to brag, uh, but it was it wasn't like literacy was an issue. Now in university, studying maths. Now I look at books and hear people talking about reading and I just feel intimidated and overwhelmed. I really want to share in the incredible experience everyone else is having, but it's just too daunting. I really wish I can pick up and enjoy Simon's book when that comes out. I want to read deeper into uni topics I'm studying, but I just can't. I have tried just picking up books, but it's taking me hours to get through short um, through short amount of pages where I then ditch a book and can never come back. Any thoughts or tips? Many thanks. Kind regards, your faith, kind regards, your faithful, your faithfully, sincerely, truly and intimately, Brummy Mike, P.S. Sorry for the subject, Dan. You're no more of a... than Simon. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's well, smear me attention. as well. It's <laughs> great. So, so, right. How to get back into reading was this. Mm, yeah. I mean, you're the expert here, Dan. You're, you're Mr. Reader. Well, I've said for those who who find reading not so much difficult, but a bit more of a, a sort of a chore or a struggle, um, I think that's a that's a real <laughs> gap in the market for poetry because it's so easy to consume. Oh, here um, we go. If okay. you're not a keen fan of poetry, then I would suggest maybe an anthology of short stories or you know some collection of short stories because you'll have that satisfaction of being able to complete a sort of a story in in a far shorter time than you would if you were actually trying to pick up a novel. Um, if it's helpful, I would say if you're wanting to try and get back into reading, don't read Hemingway, um, <laughs> because or, or James Joyce, <laughs> or James Joyce, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I imagine there's going to be loads of things on places like Reddit or Goodreads where people are saying, "I've wanted to get back into reading. What can you recommend?" Maybe if you know which sort of genres that you like, look at you know must reads from those genres. Um, mm. I know that there's so there's I've got two I can recall two um, sets of short stories on my shelf downstairs my sort of home library and they would be um, Kitchen by Banana Yoshimoto who's a fantastic Japanese author and the translations are really stunning because I think it really tries to keep true to you definitely just said translations 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 you sound like you're surprised. How long have you known me? Of course, I'm not going to say translations. 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 Kelly Marie what... translation. No, no, no. Translations. You're the one who's making it sound sick. Translations. Translations. Oh, you, you, you gave it like three A's then. <laughs> translations. Translations. I've now got semantic satiation, Dan. It's all your fault. Right. Anyway, Banana Yoshimoto Kitchen is very, very fine. Um... Uh, the I can't remember the author The Interpreter of Maladies um, which was written by Jumpa Lahiri which is really good um, and there's there's one more that I can't quite recall but anyway there's two um, Interpreter of Maladies is a book um, book collection of nine short stories by the American author of Indian origin Jumpa Lahiri and it's beautiful um, but Yoshimoto's Kitchen is really really interesting because as, as is so sort of prevalent with Japanese writing, um, there is a real f- sort of fascinating focus on nature and sort of astrology. And obviously in the language, um, there are many, many different words that could describe something that seems to be sort of so specific. And I think the translation, translation of, um, of Kitchen really, really does that justice. Um, what would you... What would you say to this, Simon? I mean, 
Well, actually, the recommendation that we had last episode of, uh, I think the Anthropocene Reviewed would be a really good choice because, again, it's a collection of short stuff and they're very digestible. There's like, e- each essay is maybe four or five pages. It's, you can, hmm. you know, easy to pick up. Um, I think the main thing that stops people from getting back into reading is worrying too much about what other people think about what they're reading. I think there's this pressure that when you get back into reading as an adult, you're supposed to read certain kinds of books hmm. and they have to be terribly impressive and they have to be nominated for the Pulitzer Prize and you know all this kind of thing and frankly nuts to that like if you want to read you know The Emperor of All Maladies or Merchants of Doubt or you know important you know big important with a capital I books then of course you can but if that's not what you want to read, if that doesn't spark joy, to borrow the Marie Kondo phrase, then then mm. don't. Or the graphic novel. That's a I think that's a really, really yeah. sort of under under represented um form. And it's brilliant. You know, I I I did a in my IB high level lit course, we looked at um Mouse. Have you heard of Mouse? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of this. Art Spiegelman. Very, mm. very famous. Um serialized from 1980 to 1991 it depicts spiegelman interviewing his father about his experiences as a polish jew and holocaust survivor and that's fantastic not only is it beautiful um the american cartoonist spiegelman has got a really really sort of identifiable style um but it's just a it's a it's it's a brilliant and and totally unique experience it's not like reading you know it's not like reading a novel because you've got the you know and it's it's set out as a sort of cartoon thing but it's it's brilliant really really good honestly i i would just say don't give a don't give a crap about what other people think you know read what you want to read don't feel ashamed about it and the other the other thing is is actually um i think the other obstacle is just getting into the habit of reading which is something that i still struggle with to be honest Mm. um if that's reading before bed that's great if it's reading on a commute that's fun that's great uh, i think the important thing is just to if you want to get back into it you will if you set yourself like a daily goal yeah. for it and it can literally be one page but do it at a certain time or doing a certain activity like like a commute or something yeah. um because you'll get to a point where it becomes just a, a really desirable relaxing thing to do so i you know i went to um i went to hope cove on the south coast which is very near Sulcombe. Oh, yeah. um, and was lying in my sort of swimming shorts on towel on the beach in the sun reading and it was just lovely you know hearing the kind of waves going and then every now and then get up go and have a swim come back and it's it's an incredibly it's an incredibly sort of relaxing hobby and pastime you just need to don't don't hold yourself to to too high a, an expectation as to getting into it as simon says set yourself a any goal as long as it's a goal it could as you say it could be a page could be half a page could be a sentence who knows the other thing that I'd say is, you know, physical books are one way to do it. You can also listen to audiobooks. And if that works better for you, then do that. Yeah. And personally, I do enjoy um, the, the sensation of holding a book in my hands and physically reading. But, um, you know, e- well, e-books, I suppose. You, you could also have a Kindle. If that's more practical for you, then you can always have one of those. Uh, but also, yeah, audiobooks. A lot of the people that I know who um, are in the hobby and, and painting and, and playing Warhammer, um, they actually find that they listen to audiobooks quite frequently whilst they're... Um, uh, their painting um and that works really well for them so uh, mm. ultimately it comes down to just finding the the habit and the routine that works practically for you mm. we have another email here uh and uh <laughs> this is this is a, a deep cut dan um this is from will Allsop. uh <laughs> edinburgh dark matter talk guy update wow so this was from several years ago now, where I bumped into Will outside of a talk about dark matter at Edinburgh. Um, was it Edinburgh Uni? No, it's the, it the museum in Edinburgh. Uh, and we've had, I think, two updates now <laughs> since then. So in the long-standing story, somebody needs to update the wiki because Will's got more, baby. Uh, Dear Messrs. Clark and Moore, it's Edinburgh Dark Matter Talk Guy back again with my biennial email to you two lovely gentlemen. Um, I'm now moving into the fourth year of my physics degree and I'll be studying general relativity next term. God help me. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank you two for your auditory company over this summer, which I've spent working on a summer project for Manchester City Football Club. Hmm. Wow. Which is pretty cool. Um, Believe it or not, football clubs actually want to employ physics nerds like me and the steep coding learning curve which I've been navigating has been made much more bearable by listening to the podcast during long days in my small student room with my PC blasting out 40 degree air. Oh, what a treat. What a treat. I know. 
Oh, living the high life here, Will. Mm. I actually had a Simon PV inversion-esque coding breakthrough today, unfortunately brought on by my worst ever coding howler. It turns out that five frame per second data, the frames are 0.2 seconds apart rather than 0.4 seconds apart. Who'd have thought it? And I wanted to ask Simon if you've had any other notable coding howlers since the end of the PhD. Oh, God. Um, blimey. Since the end of the PhD. I mean, the problem with identifying something as a coding howler is you have to know that it's a mistake. I'm sure that I have made them, but I haven't realized their mistakes yet. Um <laughs> Because I've done a couple of projects since, uh, you know, there's the Warhammer AI one, and there's been a couple of machine learning ones, um, and obviously Claude, which is still, un uh, and I'm actually coming back to that now that I'm back from all of my trips, and uh, the book is now kind of in. Um, so I'm sure I have made some big ones. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I think that's probably yeah because I don't really know, <laughs> I don't really know what the uh, that their problems yet. Um, come back to me, and I will. I'll have to bring it up the next time I realise I've made a big one. <laughs> Uh, also, Dan, if you don't open an exclusively skip-based law firm, you're clearly <laughs> missing a huge, possibly even skip-sized gap in the market. That's a good point. That's a good point. Many thanks again for your company this summer. Will, 42 years old, if you make the same mistake I did in my code. <laughs> wow. Um, that's uh, working for Man City. That is so cool. I did not expect that twist and turn. Um, if you're allowed to say, Will, do email in with what you've actually been doing. Um, there is actually a little postscript uh, that's saying if you'd like if you'd like to learn a bit more about the physicists who work for clubs, I'd love to um, help maybe do a video. I think that could be really interesting, actually. Um, so yeah, do do tell us, send us an email with what you're actually doing and what physicists generally are doing in the Premier League. <laughs> and finally, uh, we have uh, we have an email here from Jakob, uh, entitled "Ducks and Choirs." I'm listening. Uh, he goes on to say, Dear Simon and Dan, in your recent episode about the Hamil Hamilton Island Golf Club, you talk about new ways to have a swimming competition. Yes. Dan suggests to breed a new kind of duck that looks like rubber ducks. I was shocked to hear that apparently he didn't think of the more obvious and more duck-friendly approach to the other way around, which would be to produce plastic ducks that perfectly resemble actual ducks. But they don't peck. We we, we want there to be p peril. <laughs> Uh, anyway, peril. later later in the episode, when Dan introduced his choral piece of the week, Simon mentions that there must be a choral arrangement of Three Lions by Badil Skinner and the Lightning Seeds. So I went to YouTube and found this delightful arrangement of the song by Norwich Cathedral Choir. Oh Thanks for the God. incredibly entertaining and weirdly interesting podcast. Greetings from Germany, Jakob. Uh, um, well, I'm listening to this right now. Yeah, hang on, let's just have a have a listen. <laughs> uh, bravo, Norwich. Top form. Well done. And I'm going to skip midway through. Let's get to the meat of this. Actually, it's not just your standard a cappella arrangement of doom, 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 with the uh, sopranos taking the melody. That There's actually mm. some interesting stuff in there. Superb. Wow. I wonder Great if that's stuff. been arranged by Ashley Grote. Ashley Grote. G-R-O-T-E. I believe he is the director of music at Norwich. It, it does say that in the description. Well, he's 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 written an absolutely wicked set of responses. I heard them at Eddington Festival last year. Oh, I didn't even oh. talk about Eddington. Oh, I'll have to do that next uh, episode. Yeah, to be continued. Um, Absolutely. Jakob, thank you very much for bringing that to our attention. That is spectacular. Oh, we've got some great emails here. We're going to have to say we need to actually get on with the rest of our lives, unfortunately. But we've got some great, yeah. um, great emails here. We will be returning to, to them next week. But we do always... We we always read ed we always read every piece of correspondence. We can't, I'm afraid, read every single piece out because we do get quite a bit. Um, but for these for, for the particular gems, um, we will always return to them. So tune in next week for some very exciting stuff. So Simon, what have we learned today? This week, Dan, we learned about an erect, compact shrub with aromatic branches, egg-shaped leaves, and mauve flowers with orange markings. Oof. Of course, Prostanthera densa, otherwise known as the villus or you know kind of furry mint bush. Absolutely fantastic. We had a very lengthy conversation uh, about a load of stuff in Critics Corner. I did breeze over quickly um, my choral piece of the week, uh, The Shepherd's Carol by Bob Chilcott. But we spoke about an excellent documentary that's currently on iPlayer about 9-11 uh, in the in the president's war room. A very weird Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Yeah. Which I, I highly I implore you to watch. Uh, the Clone Wars, I, I briefly mentioned. Um the brilliant album, The Age of Plastic, which I recommend you all uh, all listen to. 
and various other things. As ever, we thanked our patrons and we had some fantastic correspondence and we got some treats lined up. Unfortunately, we both have actually got stuff to do right now. Yes. Um, but we will come back to this in the next episode, so make sure that you tune in. And that's all for this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your podcasting service of choice, join the Discord, and if you'd like to see our faces, check out our YouTube channel, Spongy and Electric. Further 80s album recommendations, thoughts on Ernest Hemingway, and other thoughts on the show can be sent to us at spongyelectric at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Join us again for another tumble down the wiki rabbit hole, and and we'll we'll see see you next time. time. What larks? Right, here we go. <clears throat> Just a quick slurp of the old magic juice. Yeah. <sighs> ASMR. Yorkshire gold tea, can't beat it. Right. <clears throat>